Welcome to the S2 Cognition Podcast. S2 is the official cognitive evaluation in sports, from youth to pro, where athletes and coaches build to win. We're glad to have you here on the S2 Cognition Podcast. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Harrison Hunter, and today's conversation is certainly a fun one. We're joined by legendary performance coach Jeremy Boone, whose track record speaks for itself, and I'm going to dive in a little bit. He's worked with Olympians, professional NASCAR drivers, NFL players, and MLB Coaches of the Year, just to name a few. He reveals how connection trumps communication when dealing with athletes, how an athlete and a coach can leverage and use their S2 profile to improve performance, and why value engineer is the only label that he wants. You can follow Jeremy on Twitter and Instagram at Athlete by Design to check him out. To help us to continue our growth, we ask that you subscribe, rate, and review our show. Enjoy Jeremy's interview. That's next. Boone, man, what a start we've already had. So thankful to have you on, man. Will you go into your journey to present? What's it been like? Ooh, uh, a wild ride. (laughs) I mean, listen, I'll tell you this. I never would have thought when I left college in 1995, 96 and moved to Charlotte, didn't know what I was doing, started my own company. I never would have thought I'd get to be on a podcast with S2 and guys who are rocking the neurocognitive world. Did not even know to think like that. So uh, that's... Dude, Jeremy, you got to take us back to the Pat Riley days. (laughs) We got to hear that story, man. That is amazing. Well, with, with Greg Brittenham and... And Mark McCown, I, I don't even know that they would yeah. they would remember that. So, um, yeah, w- went to college to Charleston, and um, didn't have a chance to try and compete. Didn't know if I even would have saw playing time anyway. Probably not. <laughs> um, and had a couple of really good friends that had got me involved in with um, strength and conditioning, and but the way they did it was kind of unique. Um, the uh, New York Knicks were in town um, that year. This was the early 90s due to Greg Brittenham, who was a strength coach with the Knicks at the time. Baller, one of the greatest, the GOAT. And um, he was best friends with Mark McCown, who is the gentleman responsible for m- me even getting involved into strength and conditioning. I mean, he's rocking. And uh, and his assistant at the time, Don Zamuda, just all really great people. And it started with an invitation. And uh, I, 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 this 30 second version of this, and we'll come back and we'll give details later. But um, I got, <laughs> I, I got asked, asked to go and help out. I'd never been in a weight room in my life and uh, was told, to spot a player on the bench. I knew nothing. I mean, I knew nothing. I grew up where um, you were playing uh, basketball, and that's how you got stronger, and that's how you get fitter. You didn't do anything but those two things. And then uh, I'm, I'm in, a, in the weight room at a college in Charleston, and um, one of the biggest men I've ever seen in my life comes in and says, don't touch the bar. And uh, and I go, well, good, because I don't even know what I'm doing anyway. And he throws a number, and he goes up there, and then he's like, man, those up there is like 315, 375. It was a ton of weight. And uh, I didn't even know how to add up the plates, and now I'm freaking out. I mean, I might have weighed 140 pounds maybe. <laughs> and uh, he gets it on there, and he goes, you touch the bar, I'll kill you. And I'm like, uh, okay, I can even lift it. He hits a couple of reps, and he walks out the emergency exit door and leaves. And Coach Brittenham, the string coach of the New York Knicks at the time, walks in and he goes, you know, he asked where the player was. <laughs> it's a big guy, man. It's Charles Oakley, big guy. And he goes, uh, he walked out of the emergency exit. Well, why did you let him go? What? And I'm literally, I'm like maybe 20 years old. What? Uh, I'm not even supposed to be in here, right? This this <laughs> wall is your fault. You let him go. Now I have to, you know, find him because it's you. And if he doesn't pay it, you're paying it. What? Like, I'm not even, this is not okay. And so they chose to have some uh, uh, fun and get inducted in. And uh, we we rocked out like that, man. So that was uh, uh, the long story, very, very short of how I got involved <laughs> in the strength and conditioning with um, Greg Brittenham and Mark McCown's invitation was just, was just awesome. I, I, I loved the world of performance not in the weight room because I didn't grow up in it on the field court. And again, it was because of having mentors like those guys that exposed me to that. So when I graduated, 
at that time, sports performance was not an, an industry, right? I mean, you were a strength coach, so you were either in a weight room under a bar or you were a physical therapist in a room with white walls and blue carpet. And I didn't want to be in either one of those. And so I didn't want to move far from, too far from home. My mom was pretty sick at the time with cancer. So I moved to Charlotte, started Athlete by Design. And here we are 28 years later, you know, 70-something world champions, Olympic medalist, and kind of crazy stuff. Uh, first um, official off-speed um, speed coach in the NFL for 10 years. That's kind of a really wild story. Uh, maybe we'll share that one if we get into it. I mean, that was wild. Um, and yeah, NASCAR and, and, and speed was really my biggest um, curiosity uh, and, and had some great mentors, Vern Gambetta, Brandon, we've talked about that. I mean, and Lawrence Seagraves and the list could go on and on. Um, but curiosity is what drove my um, learning for high performance. When we first met, your for, your initial question was, man, I'm looking for the missing piece. What did you mean by that? Here's the thing. I care about growth. And that's why I, I like, and this is not a plug for you guys, but seriously, I meant that. Like, I love S2 family and what you guys are pursuing because you guys are all about precision. And, and growth requires the truth. All the improvement starts with the truth. If I don't know what's going on, I can't help you grow right? Whatever story you are trying to tell. And in fact, this is, this is the mantra that sets up with, you know, I'm looking for you know, what's missing, but it's this growth isn't for everyone, but neither is winning brother. Right. And here's the thing. Growth is available to everyone, but it's not for everybody. And winning is not for everybody. And if you're going to work in the field of high performance, you can't even bring curiosity to the table. I have to bring extreme curiosity to the table. And if I want to be able to, to do that with a certain energy, I have to understand that I have to value precision, accuracy, truth, a compelling story, right? There's, there's some different pieces to that. Um, and, and the neurocognitive side for you all definitely fit part of the broader puzzle of what I'm trying to do in helping people go tell their championship story whatever that championship story is, right? Sometimes it's and just winning looks different for different people. That's great. We have worked a, across the spectrum, really, with you. We've worked at the high school level yeah. with some really elite quarterbacks. Yeah. Uh, and then we've worked with some NASCAR champions. Yeah. Uh, how do you manage yeah. that working one day with a young high schooler who's trying to, you know, his aspiration is, I just want to go to D1 school. Yeah. And then you've got a guy who, like, wants to be the best driver in all of NASCAR. How do you balance all of that from a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, gosh, you know what? That's a good question. I, I got, I was asked that last night. So last night we started the third annual um, Charlotte FC Captain's Academy. And Brandon, I know you guys are getting involved into the soccer space and the MLS space and Charlotte here has an MLS team. And so I partnered with them to take our leadership program in with area high school kids. So last night was our, our first one for this fall. We, we got probably 50 or 60 kids and we, and some of them are really good looking athletes. And you know, this one guy raised his hand and, it's, and it, with a sharing their desirable, but difficult to achieve future that they want to go make real. <laughs> and he raised his hand and, and he said it with a, as much conviction as he could that he wants to play in the NFL. This kid literally might it might be 132 pounds, five foot seven, and he's like uh, five foot eight. He's a junior in high school, you know. It so there's some challenge, inherent challenges there, right? And, and you know, we we don't want to abandon anybody's dream, but you know, I I think there are some fundamentals to anyone's pursuit of their story. It doesn't matter the category of the story. There's some fundamentals, just like there are fundamentals on the physical side of athleticism. Right. Whether it's Miles. Right. He's about to kick butt and take names racing up. I mean, most awesome kid on the planet. Love him. Uh, but there's some fundamental elements of athleticism that cross the cross sports leadership. There's some fundamentals of leadership that cross sports. I am interested in the fundamentals as building blocks to help people then go and take the guesswork out of what they want to accomplish and do that. So whether it is um, NASCAR driver who is a veteran who now re recognizes in order to continue to compete, I've got to stay on that outside lane on that wall at 200 miles an hour with zero room for margin or else I'm wrecking um, to somebody that's young and wants to pursue to get into the 
professional ranks, but now you have NIL and now I can make more money in school versus trying to go to the pros. We've got a lot of constraints and a lot of variables Crazy. and stresses and pressure. And, and if we can just help people have critical conversations, understand how to think differently. And then if I can know the brain side of that, of how that brain can process information and we combine those together, we, we can cross platforms with stories and have fun. Jeremy, one of the unique things is I think that people try or, you know, it's just our human nature to try to box people or what they do or whatnot. And I think it's easy to walk away from a conversation with you, uh, hearing about you that, oh, this guy's a sports psychologist. Yeah. And that's not what you are. No. Everything that you have uh, that that you have uh, imbued to us as a company is about how to optimize performance. Mm -hmm. um, and can you just shed a little light for everybody about what that looks like? I mean, you're talking about the neurocognitive piece. You're talking about some psychological piece. You're talking about speed. Yeah. You're talking about all aspects of athletic performance, which you know we like to bucket in the five buckets or whatnot. Yeah. But you're all about optimizing all of that for, for a unique athlete. I think yeah. reading the story about your relationship with D'Angelo Williams really highlighted uh, just all of the aspects of performance and how important that is for an athlete. A lot of athletes feel like they don't have an ally across all spectrum. God, that's a great question. You know, I, I think, so when I first moved to Charlotte uh, and started my own company, right? I mean, um, when you do that, you want to eat what you kill. And, and I had to really figure out some things on the private side uh, of what's going to get people through the door and how I can start working with them. And, and speed was it. Speed is sexy. Let's be honest. Speed wins. And, and we do all that. And other things. Can Al Davis? Come is that what you Al Davis? Speed is hey, sexy. Go through. <laughs> but, you know, uh, uh, all of a sudden I started to have athletes who were hurt and athletes who were struggling mentally, athletes who had. Um, challenges at home, athletes who hated their coach, right? Athletes who, and the list went on and on. I'm like, uh-oh, I need to become more of a generalist and so I can be an advocate with and alongside my athletes so they, they feel like I'm a partner in what they're doing, right? It's nice to have a third party, right, who doesn't have a dog in your fight, but they're still going to call you on your shit. Right. This I'm gonna call you out first before I go protect you and let you play victim blame excuse and compare. That isn't happening. You know, and so out of out of that need that, and those constraints to do that, we started jumping into neuromuscular therapy. Well, I went and did that. We found out like said, now I need to go into, you know, and we kind of layered on more and more more elements to that that gave me a vocab a vocabulary in the language to say, Hey Brandon, you actually really are hurt. So let's go to this orthopedic doctor. Here are the questions. I'm going to help be an advocate for you and with you. All right. And all of a sudden they're like, oh. you know, in the pro world, like my agent doesn't know what to ask about that. Right. And so we, we want to come alongside that. You know, think of this as like colors in a crayon box. You know, my daughter's six and she's good with about 20 different colors and where it is. But you know, for me to be in high performance or the world's best, I need a box of 220 crayons. I need to know 60 different shades of blue and which shade I'm going to be able to use at which time to help, you know, paint this masterpiece to be able to do that. If I'm going to do that effectively, I can't just be a great com uh, communicator as a coach. Uh, communication is not enough. I have to be a great connector and connection trumps communication. You got to have both. But at the end of the day, connection is what trumps communication and the way I connect with the athlete is I got to be curious about their story. I have to be a great listener, not a great talker, listening wins. And then I have to be the best learner in the room. And when I can learn how to do those, those three and package those together and then go out and reach out to the best of the best to partner up with what we're doing, then, then we can have the, a, a, the right strategy to protect the mission of, of the client that we're working with. You know, I want, to, I want to take a step back here. Jeremy, we've been talking about 15 minutes about athletes. How is this information helpful for coaches? I'm sure you have conversations with coaching staffs all the time. Yeah. How, how, how do they take all of the, the 225 crayons that you're trying to work with? Yeah. How do they take a piece of that or a third of that box? And how does that information help them uh, that you get? Well, uh, you know, I, I, I can tell you, I, I can show you. I'm going to give you a great example. Let's, let's see if I got something right here. So here's what we have. So let's, 
let's 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 take an example of I mean, just from S2, right, from the neurocognitive side, and then I'll, then I'll give you a couple of broader examples of just coaching example, you know, but but this particular... Jeremy, you came prepared, man. I got to take a stop, man. You, you came prepared. Look at this stuff. Hey. <laughs> and not just athlete by design, it's graphic design. Hey, no. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> no, but like, so we, this this is an example of a profile of, of, of a high profile athlete where it has all the potential, maybe the the top potential in their sport and what they do, their brain works, you know, and that's what you guys and all your content, you guys that go through and explain each of these different isolated capacities extremely well. But the reason why this athlete struggles to win, much less be able to then win consistently is because of their risk, right? The risk profile. And we can't isolate one variable out into a broader narrative, but we have to take one isolated to get strategies to redesign environments to help improve behavior. Jeremy's showing a graph, right? We got perception speed, angle judgment, spatial memory, all north of the 60th percentile. Man, really great brain on the visual spectrum. Impulse control, distraction control, and improv also high. And we're going to get into risk and instinctive learning where it's, uh, it's, you know, what do you see there, Brandon? Yeah, lo lower scores on the risk tendency is not a good or bad score, right? It's not, but lower scores here suggest somebody who doesn't have a lot of risk tolerance. They're really risk averse, especially when there's a high potential for reward. Uh, they'd rather play it safe and just assure a good, solid performance. Um, and so that can be obviously problematic if we're talking about a driver uh, who needs to take <laughs> risks, right, at 200 miles an hour. Yeah, so I just wanted to paint that picture, Jeremy. Go ahead, man. Just want to let the listener know, man, great profile, but there are definitely some areas here with instinctive and risk that can be helpful to know about. Yeah, exactly. And, and so to your point, to tie that back into coaching, why is this helpful? Well, I mean, it, in this case, it's helpful on the talent development bucket. Right. Not the talent recruitment bucket, but the talent development bucket is it just takes the, the guesswork out of what questions do we need to be asking. Right. For the meeting of the minds of a high performance team. That's it. So we look at this, the questions that we say, are, are we leveraging the fact that we've got multiple uh, capacities here? Well, over 72 percent like this is a high performing brain. Um, but are we leveraging that in the right way? Um, or do we say, okay, how do we redesign even just language with this individual when their risk tendency is a 29%, then how, how can we do a more effective job at communicating in the highest moments of pressure and connecting leading up to those types of events to help mitigate what that risk tendency might jump in and then be the reason that we don't get a win or position the team to be able to be successful. So, you know, circling back, that's a long way to a roundabout, uh, Harrison, right? I, I think that it, you know, this type of information and, and other pieces and elements of assessments and other buckets, they help us know what questions do we need to be asking right now? What's most important? And I think that if we take a step back from there, this circles back to your very first question about the path and my path of working with high performers, whether it's a, a kid or a pro. For me, it comes down to there's only one label I want. I, not, I don't claim to be a sports psychologist. I've got, I got education in that. Neuromuscular therapy, I was licensed, certified. Strength and conditioning, like, but all those do box in, Brandon, to your point. The only label that I want to help someone is value engineer. That's it. That's the only label that I care about. And, and so these types of assessments help me engineer the most value for a coach and the way that they need to set up practice design and the way they need to do, uh, approach strategy and tactical elements for the team to support the athlete themselves and the language that they need to best use and the way that the athlete is going to listen. So not even language, but this is the way that the athlete is going to be biased towards hearing what you're trying to say and their internal narrative of their own story when they get in trouble. So all those things kind of come together, I think, to, to, you know, to be able to, again, protect the mission. Yeah, it's really tough. I, you know, for coaches today, there's so much to go on, so much to keep track of. Uh, and the heart of it is what, and what we're hearing from you is just the connection with the athlete, the connection with that particular player, 
um, understanding who they are, um, yeah. what they what their strengths and weaknesses are, and then trying to optimize or put them in the best position to to perform well. That's right. That's right. And and then look when we come back. So how many times, Brandon? I mean, you're a coach. You're a high performing athlete, and you work with people. How many times do you hear from coaches who say this athlete? could be so much better, but they're struggling with confidence. Like that's the, that's the phrase we all hear all the time. But then we go back and even if we take like that profile that we just showed, right? High capacities in a lot of areas and struggling with two. And then we go back and look at the design of the environment that the coach has for the athlete. So we go back, no wonder that that athlete is struggling with, with confidence because you've got that athlete operating in fear and threat every single day. And, and we can help you redesign so you're operating in challenge, not in threat. And so they can show up and take risk and feel like that they belong, right? And that's the piece too. If they just feel like they're here or if they just feel like they matter on the condition that blah, 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 you're not going to get the most out of your athlete. And so uh, belonging is important, but belonging has a lot of different elements and qualities to be able for that athlete to show up. It's really interesting. Brandon, we talk about this all the time. We try to, you know, failure in practice is is not a bad thing, but you talk about cre- coaches that create this fear environment. Hey, I can't mess up and I can't mess up in practice because if I mess up in practice, I'm not going to play. Right. That's exactly right. And, you know, we kind of take a unique approach to that because we want to push the needle a little bit for each athlete individually in practice. We want to see them, hey, this is what this feels like to make this decision. And that's not the right decision. Well, if we ask them, you know, maybe, maybe I need to step, take a step back. Brandon, can, can you define feel, right? And and how, you know, every coach is like, hey, you know, I need you, I need you to be a little bit more patient here. Or, hey, I need you to be a little bit faster on this decision. If you don't practice that feel, how can they know? Will you, will you give us a little background on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is something that I, this is the world I live in on a daily basis. I struggled with that as an athlete, for sure. You know, when you were an athlete in the early 90s, every coach operated, it's a fear principle. Every day is a competition principle. Um, you know, and from a, it, taking it from a learning perspective, we went through this phase in the early 2000s, this errorless learning. Right. If we minimize all of the mistakes, that's how we best learn. And we can replicate that over and over again. But there's zero sport in the world that provides this is the framework of how it's going to work. Right. We've got to figure it out. The game never operates like you go into it expecting. So then what happens? Um, We ask these athletes, hey, you've got to have a feel for this. Feel is something that is generated over experience. You've got to fail. You've got to fail plenty. Um, you know, you've got these athletes who are trained, especially in sports like football, go as fast as you can all of the time. And then they never had that opportunity to practice what it feels like to be really, really patient and let things unfold and only focus on accuracy. If you've never felt where those boundaries are, you're never going to feel that optimal balance of speed accuracy, uh, patience and speed and, and those kinds of things. And so you've got an, uh, an athlete who's always operating at 100, 100 miles an hour uh, and is just reckless in their decision making. Um, so they never develop that feel. And the other thing that we've learned over the last 10 years or so is that while you can learn much quicker in errorless learning, your learning curve is very steep. Um, It also plateaus very early and it's not very uh, flexible. So you can't apply it to other situations. When you have errorful learning and you allow your athletes to make mistakes in practice and learn from them, the learning curve is not as steep, but it goes far higher and it's more applicable to more, it's more stable and applicable to other situations. I get it. When you've got a college athlete and they're competing for a starting position, there's no tolerance for errors in practice. You make a bunch of errors, you're never going to see the, the light of day. So the struggle for an athlete and having the opportunity to work off season and learn those kinds of, hey, I can make a bunch of mistakes and there's no consequences, that can be a huge benefit. You can change an athlete's trajectory uh, going into their junior year or senior year by having that off season opportunity to learn from mistakes and learn from feel and things like that. Man, listen, this is exactly why I love S2. Uh, like, like with Brandon, it, because 
you know, he can take that type of information. And I've sat there with the athletes that you guys have partnered with me with and, and take something and make it very practical for them to understand. You know, I think, um, can I interject something though? To that, to that example. We love that. Just, just to have a little fun. So, you know, I, like we talked about, neurocognition is one, you know, they're different pieces. You guys have your five buckets, which I think are spot on. You know, by around 2004, 2005, I was my third year going on with um, the Carolina Panthers as their off-season speed coach. And I was then, I think, for nine. And I was really, really frustrated because we could help athletes develop physically. But then during the season, and it wasn't just the Panthers, I and mean, we had clients from the women's national soccer team, from Major League Baseball, from the Boston Reds. We had we had all, all athletes. But we were frustrated because they struggled to display those skills during competition, their competitive season. And some of that came back to that the coaches didn't know how to effectively use the talents of the athlete, right? You don't really know what you have. And again, like with that profile that, that we just talked about in a second, I mean, if, from the talent recruitment, if you know you have that, you can game plan more effectively with precision and accuracy. But then also the psychology side. And psychology is critically important. We all use it. We all talk about it. Um, you know, and we use the, the tools from psychology, right? Visualization, self-talk, goal setting, all those types of things. But I needed to know with athletes that I didn't have time to observe. They would fly in. I'd have them for a weekend and fly out. So I couldn't know their personality, and personality impacts performance. But a guy like Julius Peppers back in the day, he was the quietest, most introverted person on the planet. <laughs> but when he got on the field, right, it came down to decision-making, which is what you guys talk about. Uh, and I came across another little-known science called formal axiology. And axiology is the science of human value and decision-making. And the easiest way for those of you that are listening right now, because you're going, axiology, what? Astrology, what? You're like, no, axiology. <laughs> no, no astrology. Right? No astrology yeah, on No this astrology. No, no. I'm not about, right, and happening, right? <laughs> I, want, I want science based on math right? to do that is important. But um, we would say that... Um, that neurocognition, neuroscience is to the brain as axiology is to the mind. You have to have both. Can't just single out either one. And that way we further take the guesswork out of what they do. And that's where I spent the past 15 years in the mind side of measuring value judgment, how people make decisions through the lens of valuation uh, uh, in their self view, everything inside of their skin, and in their world view, everything outside of their skin. But the limitation always was just the mind side wasn't enough. We needed the brain side. And for, that yeah. is why this relationship for me is just like I'm a kid in a candy store because we can like, okay, we've got, we, we can measure and look at the mind and, and say some stuff out of the gate to know what questions to ask. But now when we can look at the processing side of the brain and put that together, we can get more more accurate in how we help people, right? And so if we take that um, profile of, 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 what, of what you guys had, and then if we, we can, on the mind side, we can measure um, things like self-motivation. And, uh, and you used, Brandon, in that example, the word feel. And yet they got to feel it in the moment and feel it. And, and if we combine, do they have the capacity to do that from a brain perspective, then how they make decisions about themselves. If their valuation, though, is driven systemically, they're just about a number, a number, and an outcome. It's hard to get an athlete to feel, right, the intrinsically. And so we can extrapolate all of those things together to come back and create the best experience possible together. That's why S2 is badass. <laughs> for me, <laughs> right? For for me, right? That's now you have a you have a, a TED talk on axiology, do you not? Yeah, yeah. We, TED talk is if the funny. It was um in November of 2019. Uh, it's a couple months, just a couple months before yeah. COVID hit. Oh, yeah. And it was called and it's titled "The Courage to Connect." And in there, we introduce axiology a little bit. Um, and if I could go back now, I'd put all the cool brain stuff from you guys in that talk. So, Brandon, maybe you and I'll have to tag team and, and do a TEDx talk again. Yeah, that's really cool. We'll have to put a link to that, uh, that in, the, oh, yeah. in the description. Oh, yeah. 
it'll, it'll be in the show notes and, and you go into it a lot further in detail around the halfway point, right? So if anybody really wants to get in this formal axiology, um, understanding the explanation more, it'll be about that time. Yeah. So we'll put that in the description. Yeah, for sure. Here, here's, here's the other piece though that, man, Kelly, you guys are, God, I'm just, I'm, I can tell I'm an ST <laughs> junkie because, uh, again, you guys answer the question, now what? And that's always been my frustration in the world of high performance in the science side, whether you're testing physically, mentally, emotionally, cognitively, and go, you know, anything is, so then you have all this data. Now what, what does this tell me? And coaches get frustrated and axiology had that in the beginning and until I got on board and we simplified it down like you guys are doing it. Okay. I see this, but what does that tell me as a coach? I need to know now I can interpret 20 pages of data. And I just found out right before the show, Brandon, you're telling me you guys have a playbook. And I promise this is not a commercial, but I, I'm a coach first before anything. And I, I want things that are pragmatic for me, that are clear and pragmatic. So I'm excited to jump into the playbook side when people say, well, now what? Right. And, and, and they don't understand the brain. So I'm. Um, that's my next venture uh, that you guys got me excited about. Yeah, it's great. We hope to just provide uh, some conceptual frameworks about how to operate and how to improve these skills. Coaches are really creative and really savvy. We don't want to be coaches, right? We want to provide the coaches with the framework of, hey, you want to improve impulse control on a hitter? Here's how to think about it. Here's some potential drills to think about and really sort of work that into your game plan about how you understand an athlete, how you use an athlete. And we try to break things down into like, we call them quick fixes, right? These are ways to optimize performance by how you use that athlete on the field, what positions you put them in, those kinds of things, and then more from the development side, which Jeremy, I, I know you know, this is hard work. This is really hard work, how to really move the needle uh, over time. Obviously, the younger you are, the better we are, uh, the more malleable these things are. But working with high level athletes and trying to ch to move the needle in the way that they process information takes a lot of dedicated work. Man, it does. The mind is a terrible thing to waste. And now we would actually say the mind and the brain is a terrible thing to waste and uh, to be able to help young people um, take advantage of their talents and gifts. That's an important thing. You know, we, when we work with athletes, this is what we, one of the rules that we, we really put in, we'd say, look, we want you to leverage your talent, not rely on it. And right. the athletes that struggle to tell their story the way that they want to is somewhere they struggle with discipline, which Brandon, as you taught me, the brain is not wired for self-discipline. That's what you told me. And I wrote <laughs> that bad boy down and I put it on my slide, right? And, 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 and in my words, it's, the brain's not wired to get you to your mountaintop, but self-discipline is the reason why to be able to be able to do that. And so if we can go in and, and look at that, man, we can, um, help athletes leverage what they're given and not rely on. If you rely on anything in life, you're done. It's over because everybody's getting better. Everybody's getting better. But if we can figure out to take information um, and apply that in a team setting and connect with athletes relationally, communicate with them effectively, paint a very clear and compelling preferred future story, man, we got a shot to do that. And, and that's what being the best at getting better means. That's that's what we're trying to do, man. That's right. You can follow Jeremy on Twitter and Instagram at Athlete by Design. His podcast on uh, on is it Apple Music? Is this yeah, still there? Still Apple there, Music, man. the winning, winning leader, leader, baby. It's there. a beautiful image of your face. That's how I know. I was like, is this the right one? No, there it is. There's Jeremy. Face, face. for radio. <laughs> Here's face, face for radio. radio. <laughs> well, before we get into uh, before we get into our last three questions. What's a current project that you got working on, man? What are you, what are you doing right now? Again, we just we just kicked off our national uh, Desire to Lead program. So desire to lead .com. If you're looking for leadership in in high school youth, man, it's a give back. We've we've got schools from 27 states and four countries. Um, we are working on actually a paper that I'm going to meet with Brandon and Scott on combining axiology and the S2 report as a complete map. And we want to be able to submit that to one of the, one of the journals. So that 
I met about that last night and Brandon's just hearing about that right now. So boom, you wanted uh, the real question right now. Literally, I, I, that's that's what's on this sheet of paper right here. Like, uh, so man, we're, yeah, we're going to get out my to-do list. Hang on. Do it. So we're having, we're having fun with that. And, uh, and, and we're building out um, leadership um, curriculum in the corporate space to be able to help small businesses and entrepreneurs you know, become leaders that their small team wants to follow. I mean, look, leadership is what's going to get everybody through 2024. That's it. It's the currency that matters. And the way you become a better leader is you got to start by knowing your brain. <laughs> so Ooh, I love that, Jeremy. I love that, Jeremy. That's well said. Okay. First question, rapid fire. You yeah, ready? Let's go. What's the one takeaway after these 35 minutes? What's the one takeaway you'd like everyone to have today? They could take one thing with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say this be because listening to your podcast it requires a level of attention, right? I mean, like, it's not, if you're going to get better, you actually have to listen and hit rewind, which means you have to be present when you're going to get better. So I would say the one thing that you walk away from this and listen to all of this information is if your presence doesn't make an impact, your absence won't make a difference. Be present. Even when you're learning, when you're teaching, when you're coaching, and when you're leading. If your presence doesn't make an impact, your absence won't make a difference. You know, everyone says that Mike Tomlin leaves them with one liners that they're like, oh, I, I need to think about that. I, I think you you rival Mike yeah, Tomlin here, Jeremy. Ready. <laughs> What's that second question? What has been your coolest uh, singular moment as working as a performance coach? Oh, man. Wow. Golly. Um, it's the number of times that I've got to hear athletes at all levels. I mean, at all, but especially in high performance, right? That looked at me and said, we did it. Mm. I mean, that, that made me feel included, right? Because I didn't do it. They did it. They did the work. That's but right. when they call me and say, we did it, that that's the moment that keeps me coming back, right? 30 years from now, when you look back uh, on all the work that you've done, what do you hope to say? Um, that I've been able to help people learn how to make better decisions. That's it, right? Because at the end of the day, and even if, whether it's leadership or whether it's performance, you know, all roads come down to you learn to make a better decision, you get a better result. And mm -hmm. that I've been able to help people learn how to engineer value to get their story told, and more importantly, objectively, to make the world a better place, man. That, that, that's that's what I want. That's great. Jeremy, it, it takes a unique individual just to want to help others and dedicate their lives to helping others. So we're really fortunate uh, to have you not only on this planet, but in our mm -hmm. corner. Uh, Appreciate yep, that. Absolutely. Appreciate that. Appreciate your time, Jeremy. You'll be coming on uh, pretty soon again. Hey, right? listen, I, I, anytime I am coming back and hanging with you guys, and uh, I, I think it'd be fun to let me come back on and interview you. Right. Let, let me yeah. let, let's, <laughs> let's let's switch it. And, uh, and and I got some fun questions for you guys on the spot. <laughs> the other the other thing that you don't know about, Jeremy, is that anytime you go to Mooresville or Charlotte, the eating venues are Ooh. ridiculous. Like, man, right. we're talking strip mall places, yeah. but like with unbelievable food. Yeah, man. Yeah. See, we, we could do a okay. live on the spot podcast. Yeah. Right. <laughs> You want to do a home and home, Jeremy? Let's Is that go. what you want? A 2024, 2025 home and home? Let's do it. We'll figure it out, man. We'll figure it out. <laughs> I really, really appreciate you guys. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, and, and honestly, thank you for pursuing the question that you're trying to solve. Take the guesswork out of the brain to help people be more accurate in what they're trying to pursue, what they're trying to achieve. Thank you for that. That helps practitioners like me and others. And uh, the, the podcast is awesome. I, I share it with all people all the time. So you're winning that mission too. So I appreciate you guys. Thanks, Thanks Jeremy. Jeremy. Thanks for listening to the S2 Cognition Podcast. You can follow Jeremy on Twitter and Instagram at Athlete by Design. If you like the content we're putting out, please subscribe with that plus sign at the top of your app, leave a review about the episode, and share it with a friend. You can follow us on Twitter at S2Cognition and Instagram at S2.Cognition. If you'd like to get in touch with the show, please visit our website at S2Cognition.com slash podcast. Thanks again for listening to the S2 Cognition podcast. Your host, Harrison Hunter, signing off for now. We're excited to bring you another episode.